Since Reagan, or perhaps since Goldwater, the baseline conservative take on capitalism has been that it's an unalloyed good. Um, this is surprising coming from a movement that prides itself on its rejection of ideology. Unalloyed goods are, after all, the province of theology, and when they ascend into the realm of political and social analysis, they tend to suggest that an ideology is afoot. Even those who take a less ideological approach to capitalism, call them the two chairs for capitalism crowd, typically revert to the argument that it is the best of all possible systems. While this may be true, and I think it is true, um, it tends once more to put the matter starkly in black and white terms, either capitalism or the rejection of capitalism. And I want to kind of shake that a little bit today. There is no doubt that capitalism is an ingenious system of wealth creation. Proponents like to cite long-term statistics. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in England, for example, the average number of calories consumed by the average Englishman has risen about 49%. What is typically left out of that account is that in the 270 years prior to the Industrial Revolution, under English feudalism, the average number of calories consumed rose by about 23%. That puts capitalism as being about twice as good as feudalism. It still takes the prize, but contextualizing it somewhat shows that it's not the only system. What is often ignored by conservatives, however, is that capitalism has a cultural impact. I mean capitalism itself, not a particular variant of capitalism. Marx and Engels, who are obviously very popular in this room, certainly thought that capitalism had a specific cultural effect. Constant revolutionizing of the means of production, they wrote in their Communist Manifesto, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguishes the bourgeois epoch from all others. All fixed, fast-frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. The fathers of communism, who I would argue dislike bourgeois morals far more than they dislike capitalism, approved of this development, stating with obvious relish, all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned, and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life. Well, an interesting study was recently done by the Newman Forum in the United States it sought to determine if capitalism can indeed be shown to have cultural effects. Trying to determine this statistically is quite difficult, but the study took Ireland as a natural experiment. Now, while the early Irish Republic was indeed capitalistic, it was plagued with economic problems that impeded its development. It was only really in the 1990s, with the lowering of corporation tax rates, and the inflow of foreign direct investment that I would argue Ireland became a modern capitalist economy. The study in question compared the regions that had received large amounts of foreign direct investment to, tho to those that did not. It found that the region saw sharper declines in religious belief, higher rates of cultural, social, liberal cultural views, and increased political fragmentation. All that is solid melts into air indeed. This should not surprise us. After all, what does the perfect late capitalist subject look like? Capitalism, I hate to tell people who don't understand, is about the maximization of profits and not really about anything else. Profits increase when production and consumption increases. So does GDP. Therefore, the more the average person spends their lives engaged in production and consumption, the larger the potential profit and the larger the gross domestic product. It logically follows that the ideal late capitalist subject is the person who spends a maximum amount of their life engaged in work and consumption at the expense of, say, raising a family. More on that in a moment. Let's think about this a bit more. Who is the perfect consumer? Obviously, the person that maximizes their consumption of goods to the detriment of all else. The perfect consumer is an addict. Not a drug addict or something similar that might drain worker productivity, although recent late capitalist developments show that having a certain percentage of the population addicted to taxable drugs is a viable business model, something that should concern us. No, the perfect consumer is addicted to consumption, to shopping, to scrolling online, to consuming goods, and increasingly images. 
There's more than a few theologians and moral philosophers here today. Perhaps we should ask them, what is more likely to get people addicted to consumption? The promotion of vice or the promotion of virtue? Convincing people to raise a stable family, for example, or the commodification of sex? I think the answer is all around us. And who is the perfect producer? Also an addict, but this time addicted to work. Someone whose entire identity revolves around their job. Studies suggest that about 10% of the population are addicted to work. Psychologists have now discovered, or perhaps created, a personality disorder to describe many work addicts. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder, they call it. By all accounts, work addiction damages the capacity of people to do anything else, such as develop the relationships needed to raise a family. Marx loved to point out the contradictions of capitalism. He believed, for example, that there was a tendency of the rate of profit to fall because of capitalism's innate tendency to increase mechanization. His argument on this front was logically flawed and has been empirically disproven. But that should not blind us to the fact that capitalism may actually have different contradictions. If you've taken a few economics courses, one of the things you likely remember is that long term, growth comes from two variables and only two increased technological development, and increasing labor force. Technological change is thought of as something that comes from outside of the economy, from scientists and so on. One wag put it that it was manna from heaven. What about the increase in the labor force? Well, I'd say that's a question you'll have to ask your parents. It's a question of the birds and the bees, I'm afraid. More seriously, the labor force increases when stable families form, and the fertility rate is above the replacement rate. That is 2.1 for those interested, two to replace mom and dad, and 0.1 to replace uh, the ch children that die before the age of 18. Well, we're back to our perfect consumer producer then. We're back to whether this perfect consumer can form a family unit. I would argue that it cannot. The Weberian ideal type of producer consumer is an isolated individual who likely lives in an expensive apartment in a large metropolitan area works for a large corporation, and logs an enormous amount of screen time. You might be familiar with people like this. In the short run, it is in capitalism's interest for people living within the system to spend as much of their lives as possible engaged in production and consumption. And I don't mean that abstractly. I mean that in concrete terms. Dating apps, after all, make money by keeping people on the dating apps. I hate to reveal. But in the long run, capitalism needs babies to grow. Stable families are required to raise the next generation of workers. Well, this is a contradiction. It is plain as day, and it's reflected in the cratering birth rates that we see in all the advanced capitalist economies. Capitalism cannot solve this contradiction because capitalism is not self-aware. It is just a game played by decentralized individuals in search of profit. There is simply no incentive for capitalists to think in the long term about fertility rates. And so they will not. Without some sort of intervention to ensure stable family formation and the reproduction of the species, frankly, capitalism will eat itself because it won't have any workers. Late liberalism is not a bug, but a feature of late capitalism. It is the point at which everything, all identity, is turned into a consumer choice or an entrepreneurial project. It is the point of total social atomization that Marx and Engels cheered on. And it is of no surprise that it seems to precipitate more than a few revolutionary rumblings. Are there solutions to these problems? Possibly yes, but they must be aggressive. Incentives matter, economists are correct on this. But the decision to get married and to have a family is a big one. It's not like choosing between a Mars bar and a Snickers. This decision used to be encouraged by social pressure, but that pressure is long gone. The only way to reverse these trends are by some combination of ag aggressive positive marketing and robust economic incentive outside of the capitalist system and therefore by the state. Any strategy of positive marketing is faced with the fact that the corporate media entertainment complex appears to be in some sort of self-destructive debt spiral. I'm not sure if anyone's noticed. But this may be a good thing because the average person's social media feed is so full of misery that well-constructed positive messaging might even break through. Meanwhile, the economic incentives will have to be very large. 
A few percentage points shaved off a tax most young people do not know exists will not be enough. The state will have to make very clear that by having a family, a couple will receive substantive, life-changing benefits. We've been in a day's... Thank you. We have been in a daze for decades. We have convinced ourselves that capitalism provides the economic base for endless prosperity, and conservatives can provide the cultural superstructure to balance this prosperity with virtue. Yet as the hamster wheel of late liberalism spins on endlessly, it is becoming increasingly hard to ignore that the economic base has a distinct impact on the cultural superstructure. It is time, I would say, for conservatives to go back to basics. Thank you.